my dad, when he said, okay, you're going to go to Houston, you're going to get a football scholarship. Okay. Well, you're going to do this and you're going to go to the pros. Okay. You're going to go to, you're going to, you're going to um, uh, be an all pro and you're going to go to pro bowl. Okay. You're going to win the Super Bowl. He told us that the week we get ready to play the Patriots are undefeated. You already won the game, son. It's already done. You're going to win the Super Bowl. Like he, he never said if. Mm. And I grew up, and I, I remember going, wow, my dad never said if. He truly always said when, which I don't know if he knew what he was doing. I don't think, so. I don't think he knew consciously what he was doing. But he programmed with, by always telling me when, in my head, if there's something I want, it's when it happens, it's not if it's going to happen. I'm Danica Patrick, and I'm pretty intense. The fantastic, the wonderful Michael Strahan is on the show today. He is somebody that I've known for a really long time. I actually met him in New York. We were doing an awareness campaign together. And, uh, and we, you know, we, he's just a really friendly guy. So anytime that we've seen each other after, it always feels very, um, it always feels uh, very uh, warm and, and like we've known each other for much longer than we really have or, or know each other much better than we really do. Um, so uh, I, I was so excited that Michael was able to finally come talk to me. I've been asking for a while, but my goodness, what doesn't Michael do? Of course, he went from being um, in the NFL, won a Super Bowl ring, uh, was um, an amazing player with a list of accomplishments inside of the NFL, and, um, and, uh, and, and all of the poor quarterbacks that he tackled in his day. Um, but what I found, and of course now he's on TV and is like a fascinating TV personality that, you know, is just the happy, bubbly, smiley guy with the cute little gap in his teeth that uh, entertain, entertains us in the morning on GMA and uh, amongst many of the other shows that he's a part of. Um, but what I found really uh, interesting and surprising was uh, his level of awareness for the power of the mind and how he's used it in his career to uh, improve as a person and improve his, uh, what he's capable of doing um, with the mind. And simple things like not using the word if, but using the word when, um, and the lessons that he learned from his dad and his mom. Um, also, he, uh, he lived in Germany, and the fact that he was, he only played football his senior year of high school and got a scholarship to go to college for, it was, it's just amazing. His level of dedication once he commits to something is really impressive. And, and then of course that magical power of belief that he's going to do it. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Uh, so fantastic, fantastic human, Michael. Uh, I really uh, hope that you get as much from this conversation uh, as I did. Please enjoy. Thank you for coming, Michael. Of course. Um, whenever your name comes up, I always love to tell the story about when we did the awareness campaign. Yeah. And we were in New York here for the launch. Mm -hmm. And there was five of us in the campaign, and one didn't show up to dinner, and we were standing there talking. Yeah. And you said, you know, I've had a real job. This isn't a real job. Nah. And he said another thing that I've said so many times in my life afterwards because it's so true. You said, I got to eat dinner anyway. Yeah. And I was like, that's so right. And the, the amount of times I've used that in my life where I think to myself, what, what, I, what should I do? And then I go, mm -hmm. you know what? I got to eat dinner anyway. I might as well go work a little and PR yeah. and eat at the same time. And, you know, and, and it's, um, it's sometimes you got to figure out a way to psych yourself up into doing stuff. Yeah. Because as you know, when you're constantly around people and, and all the energy, it takes a lot of your energy mm -hmm. to, to like walk in the room and and have all these conversations coming your way and like doing your thing. But I always look at it as, as a way of gratitude because at one point I always wanted what I have. And now that you have it, don't complain about it. Because mm -hmm. I've just seen that so much. People mm -hmm. want success. People want um, to be great at something. But when you're great at something, if you want it or not, comes a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So don't get the responsibility and everything that comes with that job or that 
that that clout or whatever certain people search for, you get it, and then all of a sudden you forget. Mm -hmm. Like you start to take it for granted, and you could never do that because before you know, you look up, it'll be gone again. What was your real job? You said football I've was my real job. <laughs> oh come on! You football was my real job. Trust me, getting yeah. beat up. Yeah. And, and and for me, it wasn't even the games. Yeah. Like the games were the fun part. As they, and I've heard many guys say they didn't play. They pay you for practice, which is so true. Yeah. But training camp is what I hated. <laughs> the you, summer you, stuff, right? The summer stuff. Yeah, that I had no idea it went like that. What? Tell everyone what it what you guys because I just thought, oh man, started dating Aaron, and I thought, oh, this is great. <laughs> Fourteen games this is a quick season. It's not like NASCAR where you're out there for forty weeks a year. Yeah, which is crazy. I mean, that's good. Forty weeks a year is insane, and you know, football is not quite that. And a lot of people wonder why don't they play more games like basketball? Why don't they play more games like baseball? Because physically, I don't. It's impossible to do. A guy hates playing on Sunday and then having to have to turn around and play on a Thursday is tough enough. So you know, training camp I hated. Because you're sleeping in a dorm room bed, and you have to push two beds together to make them even suitable to fit. Especially for you. Yeah, and then you have to lay across the bed so you didn't fall in the seam from when you put them together. Because you're too tall. Because you're too tall. And, and, and then you have to practice twice a day, and everything is so scheduled. Your meal time, your practice time, your rehab time. I love the structure of it, but I just did not like waking up in the morning so early and going to practice and you're putting on these shoulder pads and mm -hmm. that are still wet inside from the day oh, before. What? And it's like cold. Were they yours at least? They were mine at okay. least. Okay. I'm just so warm. I don't want to lay on the ground and get my pants and legs wet and cold again. Yeah. And then you have to start running into people. Yeah. And I'm not, I, I don't feel like hitting anybody. <laughs> I just don't. Why and after, didn't you say that during the season when you were looking at people like Aaron? Because I don't feel that like hitting was, people today. Because that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> that is fun. Being in the games is like, oh, that's the only thing I'm, I miss the guys. The number one thing I miss is the camaraderie around the guys, you know, in the locker room and all that. Other than that, the only thing I miss for football is like that game day. You walk out and there are 80,000 people screaming and mm -hmm. you feel like a gladiator. Mm -hmm. You literally feel like a gladiator. Well, you guys kind of are. Yeah, yeah, in a lot of ways, a modern day. And mm -hmm. But I, that is the only thing I miss. I don't miss the practice stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't miss the soreness. I don't miss, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the different things that you have to do. But I do miss that. And all those things that I hated about it, whenever I have to do something that I'm not necessarily feeling so great about doing, I always think, you know what? This be still alternative. Get out of bed and go to work. Yeah. Get out of bed and go do this. Go do that. You have to, you know what? It be still alternative and it is uh, what you did before has got you in this position and um, embrace it. Don't run from it. Like enjoy it. Perspective. Life's yeah, perspective. Gratitude. What other things did football give you as perspective? Um I think I'm very in tune with like people and 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 teamwork and how to get the best out of people and make people feel valuable and comfortable because everybody does have a value and I, I I've always been growing up in, in you know Germany I was always the kid who was cutting the grass I was the kid who was moving the furniture I was the kid who was doing I'm um, cleaning the dishes or cleaning off your table always the person who was unseen hmm. like people wake up it's just kind of done you don't hmm. appreciate the person who does it and it's always been focused for me, and I can't help myself, it's just in my brain, my DNA, that I want to make sure that everybody who's a part of what I do or a part of like the building from the janitor to the guy who's, who the security guys, that they feel seen because they're as important as anybody else. Because if, if, if there's no security, that's dangerous for everybody. If you go in and everything else around there's a mess and nobody's cleaning up, you're like, What's going on? Everybody works together. Everybody has value. Football ta taught me to show everybody that you appreciate what they bring and their value. And, and everybody may not seem as important on the totem pole when you, when you look up and down on the hierarchy of an organization, but you still need that person to do their best. So it was very important for me to talk to a rookie as it was for me to talk to a guy who had been on the team as long as I had been there. 
it's very important for me now to talk to the guy who's the cameraman or the security guy or the, or my buddy Kenny who is our janitor at at the studio yeah. than it is for me to talk to the other anchors. Mm. And I think that that ability to kind of go between people all came from football, and I think it's helped me in my career now. Mm -hmm. You know, not just at GMA, but in my own office, in my own home, and everywhere. You talked about Germany, and you said that you'd be the one that mowed, and mm -hmm. you were kind of invisible. But first, talk about being in Germany. I. I had no idea that you lived in Germany, and you lived there for how long? Yeah, we were. I moved there when I was nine, and my parents. My parents. I moved there when I was nine. My parents didn't move back until I was in the NFL for like seven years. What? Yeah, they moved back until I was like twenty-eight. So you they were born nine, in Texas. I was born in Houston, but I grew up. I spent a lot of time in Maryland. I spent most of the time here in the states at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So military. My dad background. was a, yeah. He was the eighty-second Airborne Division, paratrooper, all that jazz. And then when I was nine, we hightailed it to Mannheim, Germany. And my dad was 80, 81 to 85. He retired and then stayed an extra, 81, 84. Then he retired and stayed 15 more years. In Germany? In Germany. Uh, electively, just because he Elected, liked Germany. Electively did it, loved it. My, huh. I'm the youngest of six, so you know my brothers and sisters were all there. And then they would eventually come back and go back and... My oldest brother still lives in Italy to this day. Really? And my other brothers have lived from the Netherlands to Italy to Germany to Yugoslavia to Czechoslovakia. What? They've been everywhere. Do you think that that kind of exposure to other cultures and adapting um, played a role? Oh, in big time. You know, it taught me to get along with people no matter what. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your religion is. I don't care if you're poor, if you're rich. It doesn't matter to me. People are people. And when you're a foreigner in someone else's country, it teaches you to be more sensitive to what other people's um, culture is. Sure. And to understand people a little bit better and be a little bit more forgiving. And, and that was great about growing up in Europe. I got a chance to see the world when I was a kid. So now I come back here and I and it's like, okay, I can get along with anybody because I've kind of had to growing up. Unless you wanted to just kind of be that 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 crazy foreigner who just comes over and thinks they're gonna just drop their culture on us over here in our country. <laughs> and who wants to be that guy? So it really taught me being on a military base, being around these families and soldiers who are even from all different parts of the, the country here, you have to learn to get along with everybody. Mm. And I'm innately like shy. Like when I'm not doing like TV stuff and, and everything else, so say I'm just walking down the street and people say, my God, I, I wait, you know, but inside I kind of cringe. I don't think people it's, will believe you saying weird. that. It's weird. Wow. Know, it's weird. Does that have to do with the seen part? Like feeling, you had mentioned that you yeah. don't feel seen and does that mean you don't want to be seen on some I level? I don't want to like be a... seen. I want to be seen when I want to be seen, but when I don't want to be seen, I don't want to be seen. <laughs> it's pretty it's... tough because you're striking six foot four or five. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's the you teeth know, though. Can't man. hide from the teeth. Mm. They see the teeth and it's teeth like... Teeth are yeah. like a tattoo. It's like, I gotcha. Yeah. It's like, smile for me. <laughs> Maybe make sure it's you. I'm like, do uh, they do that? Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, it, it it is kind of that. I think kind of when I played football. First time I played football, I was seven years old. I played when I was seven and eight in in Germany. I mean, in, in North Carolina. In my first year, seven years old, I was a really good player. I cried the entire game. I didn't cry because I was hurt. I didn't cry because I didn't want to be there. I loved it. I cried because whenever I would make a play, the parents would clap and cheer and say my name. It bothered me. You don't want to be seen. It's weird. Is this something you've had to unravel in your life? Yeah, I had to. I mean, then, then you know, I get to college and it's like, okay, this is kind of, get used to it. Because college was different for me because we moved to Germany and I didn't, I was more European than I was American. So to come back. Can you back, speak German? Uh, a little bit. Like, I can, you're hungry, I can get you food, you drink. Or Say, something. like, you know, how are you? It's nice to be here. I have a... Hello, V Gates. <laughs> um, hey, how are you? That was it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> but it was, um, but it, it, I cried because I didn't like the attention. And 
then it's kind of kind of snowball because only I didn't play football growing up. My senior year of high school was the only year I played in high school. I can't believe that. You played senior year and got drafted from one year. Or like you went to you got a scholarship. Yeah, I got a scholarship, so you got a scholarship from, one year. from one year. I was lucky. Right. I'm seriously lucky. Because that's is that what you'd say till today while you're still working in a whole nother profession? I'm just lucky. Bam. You're so humble. I am lucky, truly. I didn't go to school for anything. <laughs> I'm amazed I'm not living with my parents right now, like in the basement of their house or something. I what did you actually go? Man. What did you actually I went to go school, to college for? I actually went to college for psychology. Really? Yes. I love it. I love psychology. But then they were like, you got to write these papers. And I'm like, man, God, I got to write all these papers. I, got, I can write. I just don't want to write all these papers. <laughs> so then I went to business management, which both things have kind of played into the hands of what I do now. And, um, but I love school. I love learning. I had, I was just so green and raw. Like I came, I didn't to the States. I didn't know what the heck was going on in my first year. I wanted to quit. Like I hated Texas. I missed my family, missed my friends. I was ready to go back after my first semester. And my dad basically looked at me and said, what are you going to do? Your family and friends in Texas or in no, Germany? In, you, in Germany. Yeah, my whole family was in Germany. My uncles were the only ones in Texas. Why did you, why did they, did they send you back to Texas? My dad, when I was a senior in high school, well, let me go back to when I was 13. I was not act necessarily the most active kid. I was active with the fork. Eating pretty yeah, good. Yeah, no one would believe that today. Yeah, I, I, was, I was pretty active with the fork. So I had a nickname, which I didn't know what it meant, but it was Bob. And I am not thinking, as my brothers gave it to me. I'm the youngest, and buddies call me Bob. I'm feeling good, like, oh, I got a nickname, so I'm one of the cool guys. And we were running, they jump, they're jumping over a fence, and I'm having trouble getting over the fence, and one of the friends helps me over, and he goes, well, you know what, we call you Bob. I'm like, ah. I mean, booty on back. What? Yeah, like, you got a big old butt. <laughs> yeah. How booty that... on back, Bob. Big okay. old butt, Bob. I'm like... Funny story now, but how did that make you feel then? Like, horrible. Like, I cried. I mean, I'm a 13-year-old boy. I was thinking I'm cool. All of a sudden, they break me down. So I cried over that. But it was. I literally decided at that point, I, okay, I can't. I don't want to be Bob anymore. So I bought the Jane Fonda workout video, <laughs> VHS tapes. I swear to you. VHS That's tape. amazing. Jane Fonda. Come on. Jane Fonda's legendary. So I bought, I didn't have the, the spandex and stuff, but I had the, the VHS tape. <laughs> I, I had the tape, started doing the leg lifts and like back and butt side lifts for my butt. And then I bought the Herschel Walker workout book because huh? Herschel Walker was coming out of the University of Georgia. He was like the man. And I started doing push ups and sit ups. And I would watch TV, so I'll say I'd watch Dynasty or something, mm -hmm. and commercial breaks, I would do push-ups, sit-ups, and do my Jane Fonda leg lifts and do crunches. Wow. Then this program would come on, and I would watch, and then every commercial break. And after months of this, my dad said, you know what, we'll work out together. Because he was a boxer, all-army boxer and everything else. So we went to the gym. We started going to the gym when I was 13. And when I was 16, he said, you know what? I'm gonna send you to Houston. You're gonna stay with your uncle, and you're gonna get a football scholarship. And I'm and I was naive. I'm so I was like, like the color of my shirt so green. I was like, um, okay, all right. No idea what the heck I was doing. I watched football on TV at that point. I hadn't played in years since I, before you know high school. So I went back to Houston, stayed with my uncle Art, who had played seven years in the NFL. And he would take me in the front yard and slap me around and show me different stuff. I had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, went to high school. Didn't know a quarterback sack was like important. I didn't know. I just I was no idea. I was just running around. Whoever got the ball, I guess that's who I go get. And I had one scholarship to Texas Southern. Do you realize how crazy that story is? I'm telling you, I'm a lucky man. I'm a lucky, lucky man. Yeah, but luck doesn't get you to do leg lifts and get the videos and do push-ups and sit-ups during commercial breaks when you're watching TV. No, That's being not called luck. Bob does that. But you know what? It, it was a great lesson. I look back now, though. You know what it was? It was um, something I think about now. And uh, you could change anything you want. 
Is there something you don't like? Change it. It's something you don't like, change it. And for me, that was the first moment in my life I realized I didn't like being called Bob. I didn't like being um, heavy like that. So I changed it. So if there's any circumstances in my life now that I don't like, I make a decision, a conscious decision to change it. And, and Salma Hayek said something to me one time, which I always think about as well. So you cannot complain about something you're not trying to change. Yeah. And I was like, whoa. So I, I think back, it was kind of like that mentality. I couldn't go, oh man, I'm, they're calling me Bob, and then complain about it. No, I'm, I'm changing it. Yeah. I'm making a conscious effort to change yeah. it. Yeah. Has that, um, I can relate to a story like this. When I was a kid, I was a little chubby, and mm -hmm. my dad made fun of me. Wow. And I didn't all put it together until recently, but it's always been something that I attach mentally to. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I've worked out ever since. Yeah. And, um, but that's a little bit of a scar. Like it's what would be called like a attachment bond or trauma bond mm -hmm. to something that happened. And um, realizing it is important that you're like, oh, wow, that's where that comes from. But that stuff doesn't go away. That repeating cycle of thought of like, oh, I don't, think it ever don't be away. Bob, right? Or don't be... Mm -hmm. and, is that... and, and I work out now to this day. Like I work out and... I stay on it and I eat right and I do all the things that even with my schedule, I always make time to work out. Because you don't want to be Bob. I will squeeze that time in there because I don't want to be Bob. And if I don't work out for a day or two, I'm like, oh boy, something's off. Like I just You look in the not... mirror look in the mirror to look at your butt and you're like, is Bob back? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man, that, that one ab I used to have is no longer there. But I am so conscious of it now of not um I'm going back, and I, I agree with you. It's like some scar yeah. I can't get rid of. Yep. Believe me, I, yeah. I wish I could, but I always go back to that. Yeah, and I then, was like 10 yeah. when it happened. Yeah. You were 13. I was 13, and yeah. I haven't missed working out ever since. Yeah. But at, at the same time, it helped me so much in the fact that when I went to college and in the pros and everything else, I could work out by myself. I didn't need anybody else to motivate me. And, and then when I was on the field in college, and, and which transferred over to the pros as well, I also had the mentality, okay, you know, I wanted to quit when I was a freshman, went back home to Germany. My dad said, what are you going to do? Because I'd overstayed the Christmas holiday, thinking he wouldn't notice I hadn't gone back to school. And he's like, um, shouldn't you be back in school? And then at times, I'm like... Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, I'm being man about. It. I'm like, I'm being man. Now. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going back. And he said, well, What are you gonna do? And I said, Well, you know, I'm gonna stay here, get a job. And uh, he looked at me and said, What are you gonna do? And it's like a light bulb went off in my head that I can't wait for my mom and dad to take care of me forever. Literally, that's the thought that went through my head. Your mom and dad can't take care of you forever. You have to do something for yourself. And I went back to school and said, okay, I have, I'm on football scholarship. I have to play football, have to be in school. Just be your best at it. You got to do it anyway. So why do it? Kind of just be half-ass. Half -ass. Yeah. You can either be half-ass or mediocre, or you can put on just a little bit more effort <laughs> and be great. And that really completely changed my mentality that if I'm going to do it, I'm going to be great at it. I'm not going to half-ass anything. And the extra workouts, when everybody else goes home, I took mm -hmm. pride in lifting extra weights and running mm. more when everybody else would go pack it in. Mm. When guys were more concerned about going to get lunch or go hanging out with, you know, with their buddies and doing everything else, I was working. Because my goal was far beyond just college. My goal was getting out of college and not saying that I thought I was going to be a professional football player. But I just knew that you know working hard was going to get me somewhere. I wasn't sure. And... It got me to New York, got me out of, out of college and gave me a career. It's interesting you say my goal was beyond, like your goal went past college, mm -hmm. right? It was like to get through, so the workout was no big deal. Um, talk about like how, I mean like, that's an advanced mindset, you know, to have a goal that goes beyond mm -hmm. um, the immediate. And who taught you that? What were your, I mean, you come from, your parents were into sports, military. There's a lot of regiment with all those kinds of things. Yeah. Where, where did you get the mindset to be so driven? You know, it's crazy. I look back now, now I could see it. Back then I could not see 
any, I, I, if you'd have asked me that, you know, 10 years ago, 20, 15 years ago, I, said, I have no idea. Now I, I have an idea that subconsciously it was planted in my brain by my parents. Mm -hmm. And especially my dad. My dad, when he said, okay, you're going to go to Houston, you're going to get a football scholarship. Okay. Well, you're going to do this and you're going to go to the pros. Okay. You're going to go to, you're going to, you're going to um, uh, be an all pro and you're going to go to Pro Bowl. Okay. You're going to win the Super Bowl. He told us that the week we get ready to play, the Patriots were undefeated. You already won the game, son. It's already done. You're going to win the Super Bowl. Like he, he never said if. Mm. And I grew and I, I remember going, wow, my dad never said if. He truly always said when, which I don't know if he knew what he was doing. I don't think, so. I don't think he knew consciously what he was doing. But he programmed with, by always telling me when, in my head, if there's something I want, it's when it happens, it's not if it's going to happen. And I am just programmed to truly believe that everything I do is going to work out. And I don't go into it thinking it's not. And not saying that everything has, but if it hasn't, to be honest with you, it was a miracle to even get to the point to where it even got to the point to where it was um, manifested in the first place. So it's always a win conversation. For me, it's always a win. Somebody says something to me, I'm like, okay, when it happens in my head. I never doubt. I don't get stressed over stuff. I'm like, yeah, it'll work itself out. Always it'll work out for the positive. And it always does. I just don't have a fear mentality of, oh, worry about this and worry about that if it's gonna happen. No. I do it with my kids. I always tell them when. So there's no doubt. That's so powerful because I mean from everything that I read do you get into paying attention to like the mind and how it works oh, and yeah. neuroplasticity and subconscious mm -hmm. and retraining your brain repetition all yeah. kinds of different right so you know that you, you you knew back then but you definitely know now from watching that that there's if you can imagine your brain can't tell the difference between an event that's happened in your mind versus a real event yep so if you imagine the event to have already occurred when like you're it's not the if it's the oh yes it's happening like you imagine it in mm -hmm. its finality in its totality like all the way till the furthest extent mm -hmm. all that's left to happen is for it to happen yeah but you've, you've already, already, already convinced it. yourself that it happened yeah it, and and it, it I, and i truly i Speaking of sub, like subconscious never sleeps. It never does. And I'll never forget in one year, maybe my 10th year in the league or something, having a great season, going to the Pro Bowl. We go to San Fran to play the 49ers. Steve Young was still playing then. Got two sacks on Steve Young. I think I have 10 sacks on the season. We still lost the game. And I go to Arizona. We, we were supposed to play the Cardinals the next week. So instead of flying all the way back to New York, we just went and stayed in Arizona in Tucson. At a university, Arizona State or something like that. And I went to see a sports psychologist when I was, or psychologist, kind of, not even a sports psychologist. I don't mm -hmm. really know what this guy was. He's out in the middle of the desert somewhere. He Why? made me. Why? He's out, because, you know what? I was like, God, I'm having a great year, but I just didn't feel like it. And in my head, I used to try to visualize and stuff, and I visualized myself beating the offensive tackle, and I'm coming close to the quarterback, and literally I said to him, right before I'm hitting the quarterback, before I can see the completion, it goes black. Like, I can't finish it in my mind. But I'm, yeah, I'm still playing well, but I just cannot finish it in my mind. And it bothered me. So I went to um, this, this guy, and he, he talked, we talked for a while, and then he said, I'm going to make you a tape. And later he made you this tape, and in this tape is basically um, like your breathing, slowing you down, slowing down your breathing, just focusing, relaxing your body. And this, like a very powerful tape. And he said, I want you to listen to this tape every night before the game, whatever it may be. And I said, well, if I listen to it tonight, he said, don't worry about falling asleep. Your subconscious never sleeps. That's why I don't sleep with the TV on now. Mm. He's sleeping with the TV on. Now I don't do it. Whatever's on that program, you it's being it's programmed. Being programmed, and especially in those lower brainwave states of exactly. theta and delta, exactly. especially theta state when mm -hmm. you're going into delta and coming out, which delta is the deep sleep. Mm -hmm. That's your. That's your. Um, uh, it's so. It's like a hypnotherapy kind of yeah. session. Like that's where you really get the deep subconscious programming. Smart. And that's what he was doing. And and I really, so I would listen to this tape, fall asleep, wake up. 
I had, in my opinion, and it's funny because my buddy Harvey Sanders said to me, Michael, that was the greatest game you ever played in Arizona. And I said, you know what, Harvey? In my opinion of any game I've ever played in my life, and I have some incredible game, the greatest game I ever played. I felt so powerful and so clear and so free and energetic. And that tape was the greatest career change for me. And got to the point I wore the tape out. <laughs> But I listened to it so was much. Was it that, like a classic tape? Like yeah, it was old like a classic tape? tape. Wasn't a C we were no, like the, okay, it's in a DVD or C D or whatever. Myself here, but it was a classic. Okay, Salt and Pepper was about, my first tape. I'm talking about Jay Father VHS tape. <laughs> now I'm talking about a regular like regular ta a tape. But yeah, it was a regular tape. I wore it out and I used it so much and thought and to this day. I can, if I got something big coming up, I, I can sit there and lay there in bed or night for good and I can talk myself through it now. Talk myself through it and relax. It just, it's just the most amazing and just a little, like, a lot of times if I'm going to do something, he showed me the thing where you put your hand like this and somebody can pull it apart. Mm -hmm. But then he said, do like that. He pulled my hand apart. Then he said, picture a solid, solid ring of steel, unbreakable steel. And then he tried to pull it. He's... You cannot pull it apart. But if I just say, oh, let me pull your fingers apart, there's nothing you can do to stop me. It was the most powerful thing. And before I'm going to do some big event, if I was speak in front of people, because I do get nervous of, of still doing stuff with mm -hmm. people, probably think I don't, but I do. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, something I'm really nervous, I will, I will do like this and picture solid rings of steel. Like, you got this. You are, you know, you're strong, wow. solid. Yeah. And it just takes me back to that place I need to be. Huh. But, so they yeah. need to stop saying, picture everyone in their underwear. That's not productive. No, 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 because some people I don't want a picture like <laughs> that. <laughs> some people I want to picture their underwear. I'm good. Yeah. Keep your underwear on. I'll just yeah. do that. I'll mm -hmm. be good. Some people might not be wearing underwear. That gets really that, weird then. That's the scary one. Um, it's funny you mentioned that you had such a great game in Arizona after playing that tape. Whenever I think about when I won in Japan, mm -hmm. the IndyCar race that I won, uh, right before I went, I watched The Secret. And I always think about really? that till today. Have you seen The Secret? Have no. you read it or watched oh, the movie? Oh, I read it, but I haven't, read seen, it. I haven't seen it, though. Um, well, the, there were they. I don't know now. I don't know why. It, I, I think it was there. a DVD. I don't think I'm, I think it was, I think it was a DVD and I have Yeah, it was a DVD. Tape. Yeah. I had it. Um, and, uh, and I watched that before I went to Japan, and it's all it talks about is focusing on what you want mm -hmm. and uh, being able to attract it, the law of attraction. And funny enough, then fast forward like 10 years, I get a direct message from Rhonda Brine who wrote the book and, yeah. and and she sent me a message on Twitter and said, hey, I'm coming out with the 10 year anniversary of The Secret and I'd like to send it to you. And I thought, sketchy, like, you know, normally, like, sure, you're Ron O'Brien, sure you are. Yeah, exactly. And so I was replying to her saying, oh yeah, you know what, I'm happy to go buy your book from you, just um, no problem, I really, you know, love what you've done. And she's like, no, I'd love to send it. I'm like, oh God, Haley, what's the, uh, what's the work address? You know, what's exactly. the PO box? So then I gave it to her, sure enough, sent it, signed, it was really her. And I was like, wow. And so I told her that, you know. But has she heard that you? I told her when he, she had sent that message thinking, okay, if this really is her, she'll, you know, want to maybe hear this story. But she didn't know that before. No, I, not that, See, that I know. that made me think, man, somebody listen to my inner thoughts right here. Yeah, you know? <laughs> maybe she is. And that's, she's very powerful. Yeah, she's extremely powerful. But you know what else helped me too? Amazingly enough, is some people who last did the movie The Matrix. Yes. You know why that movie helped me? Because Neo fought the entire time and he, you would think, okay, he's getting better, he's getting further along and getting further along his belief of himself. But then he got to the end and he gets shot and they think he's dead. And um, the, the, the female Carrie, um, she goes over and she uh -huh. kisses him. Like and says what well, she says to him, I love you, but I kisses him. And then he wakes up and when Lawrence Fishburne looks and goes, he is the one. I was like, oh, snap, he's the one. And he gets up and they shoot at him again. And he goes, no. His belief, he completely believed in himself. And he takes the bullets and he just drops them. And I'll never forget that year. I was like, you know what? That's, that was a sack record year. 
I think. Yeah, because I watch the movie later than everybody else comes. When everybody else says, enjoy something, I'm hard-headed. I'm like, it can't be that good. I'll wait till my time. Being a little stubborn is okay. And I literally um, remember thinking, you know what? Why limit yourself? Why not believe that you can do something extraordinary? So if you get one sack, you used to get a sack in the game. You go, okay, got, oh, got a sack. Pressure's off Off now. the hook. Off the Did hook Did my now. job. I'm good. If I can get just one a game, that's a great season with 17. I'm, I've done my job. To like, okay, if I get one, why can't I get two? Why can't I get three? Why can't I get four? Yeah. Like, I stopped limiting myself. Yeah. And it was so powerful, too. And that movie, like, spark, a, a light bulb went off because of that movie. And it's just all these little things, I think, along life, if you really pay, a, pay enough attention there's so many lessons that you can learn from things that you see, people you observe. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that so many people who are successful, and more so than successful, who are happy, all have a lot of the same attributes, all have a lot of the same um, ways that they approach things, that have a certain way of looking at different things. I don't see problems when I see things. Mm -hmm. I truly don't look and go, oh, God, I got this problem I'm going to deal with, and this kid's going to drive me crazy, or this person. I just look at it, and I just calmly figure, try to figure out a solution. And to me, that's interesting. It's like trying to put together different puzzles every day, kind of find a solution to whatever issues may pop up. So not everything is meant to go perfect, right? You said that no, not everything no. follows through. Not everything gets seen to you know the way you want it to go. How do you know when to... This is something I had to learn. Letting go versus quitting, mm -hmm. especially with retiring, yeah. um, was wrapping my head around that concept because I didn't feel like I was quitting. I was kind of like, I don't really want to do it anymore. Yeah. And so this letting go versus quitting, how do you know when to let go? I think that's a hard thing. The hardest thing for the athlete, especially. Mm. We don't have careers that go for 50, 60 years. And I wouldn't want... Yeah. And you're not thinking that. about, like, there's this interesting dynamic within mm -hmm. sports, and maybe you feel the same, that you don't, number one, you don't talk about being done. No. Because, number one, you're not really thinking about it, and you're pretty young. You're also, you don't want to plant a seed in anyone else's head that you're not fully committed. That's it. And you also don't want to do the job if you're not fully committed. So yeah. it's like a light switch. It's like when it happens, it happens. Because you don't want to be out there on the field. Mm -hmm with the potential of getting hurt, you don't want to cheat your teammates, you don't want to, but you, and, you, and, so you, and you don't want to, you're not talking about retiring. So there's this interesting suddenness to yeah. retiring from sports that um, doesn't happen. And like, there's no, uh, it's not like I'm retiring when I'm 60, you know, from no. been here for 40 years. There's but as no... you know, a lot of times you get retired. A lot of guys aren't ready to go and they yeah. get retired. I think you and I were very fortunate in the fact that we yeah. retired ourselves. Yeah. And my first coach, Earl Leggett, said this, and he used to coach Howie Long, and, and he was, a, in my opinion, the best defensive line coach in the history of the NFL. Without him, I would have lasted maybe two or three years on athletic ability alone. He gave me knowledge of football. He really taught me what I did not learn in high school because I didn't play it in, in growing up and in, in college. He was the master. And he said, hey, I'm going to tell you now. He said two things to me and Howie, which we repeat to each other, because we say Earl must be extremely proud and laughing in heaven, rest in peace. He said, if you listen to me and do everything I tell you, you will be more successful and more rich than you ever imagined. And I'm like, what's the old man talking about? Thank you, Earl. <laughs> and, and it, but it was true. And he, but he worked you. He worked you like a dog. He worked you harder than any coach I've ever had to where the coach you're glad you had, not you have, that you had when he was gone. Because mm. so <laughs> during yeah, it's kind of hell. Yeah, but he was the <laughs> best. I, I couldn't have had it without him. I had a career without him. But he, he also said, you know what? You never know when it happens, but when it goes, when your game goes, it goes quick. It could go in camp. It can go in the middle of the season. It can go at the end. But when mm. it goes, it goes quick. Mm. And for me... When I retired, I, I wasn't crying at my retirement. I was freaking happy because yeah. I put everything I had into it. I remember thinking to every practice, okay, go out here and go hard in practice. Your body's 36 years old. It may break, but if it does, make sure it breaks going hard instead of out here, you know, taking it easy and no being half careful and safe. Don't know half-assing. And you'll never 
strap a helmet, and I'll never put on another shoulder pad ever again. Think about that thought. You'll never have to do it again. So put everything into it while you have to do mm. it so you have no regrets. And I was so afraid after we, we, we won the Super Bowl and Giants offered for me to come back, definitely enhance the salary, everything else. And I said, no. Because one, I was afraid that I knew it was going and I felt had I gone back, it was going to go pretty quick. I knew at some point. Taking me too much to keep up with, with and, and stay where I needed to be to compete at that level. Physically. Physically. Yeah, it's and, brutal. And I mean, just seeing it, it's brutal. Mm -hmm. I was, I just did not want to give another pep talk. Yeah. I didn't want to jump up and stomp out speeches. I didn't want to tape my fingers up anymore. I just didn't want to do it. And it was very sudden. We won that. You couldn't, after the Super Bowl, you could say, lot of them play tomorrow. I'd be like, yes. But after we won and I had a chance to settle in, I said, what else is there left to prove? I put everything I had into it. No regrets whatsoever. Hmm. I'm not going to cheat the game. Like you said, I'm not yeah. going to go back when I, my head had already retired just for a few bucks. Yeah. Because there's more value to me in going out on top. And there's more value to me than going out knowing that, you know what, I went out on my terms. And when you're in a locker room, and, and I saw Justin Tucker earlier today, we were laughing because they used to call me old man. What's up, old man? Oh, you so old. And, you know, and I'm like, I'm 36. <laughs> in every other life, that's old, but in football, is not. But we had a, a big laugh because I told them so many things about being older, an older player and, and, and all those different things that he literally called me after I retired and said, oh, I don't know how you did this for so long. And, 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 but they all, I, I try to teach all these young guys the same thing that I, mentality that I had, go as hard as you can, get as much as you can out of it. And then when it's over, it's over. You have no mm -hmm. regrets because the worst is to have regrets that you mm -hmm. didn't give it everything you had. How does that roll into knowing when to let go of other things that aren't quite so sudden, right? They're like a little more blurry. It's yeah. a little bit, a little bit harder to go. I, I mean, it gut. could be everything from a relationship mm -hmm. to a business that you try and start and you're like trying, and trying, mm -hmm. trying, like how, what are the signs? I think relationships are probably the hardest one because relationships in some way, shape or form involve you, but they also involve others. And I think in relationships, I know for me in the past, you're in a relationship with someone and say the relationship is public in some way or people because they know you know who you're with or whatever. It becomes some time where you're like, ah, you know what? I know this isn't working, but I cannot try to make it work because so many people see us together. So many people associate us from being together. It's kind of like, I guess we're supposed to be together now because we're known to be together. It's a weird thing. But I think once you get over that and realize that it's your life, you live it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather be apart and be happy than be miserable together. It's just, life's too short to be miserable with someone. You need somebody who compliments you, who makes you feel, you know, great and, and happy, and I've had to learn that over the course of, 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 of an imperfect relationships or imperfect life. And when it comes to businesses and things like that, I've, I've had the opportunity to be around some smart people, incredibly smart people in business. And one thing I noticed, things are very emotional when it comes, uh, unemotional when it comes to business. Mm -hmm. Business is not personal. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you gotta cut your ties because I found trying to save certain things is more tied up into your ego than it is actually to if it's supposed to, if it really is going to make sense or work. Mm -hmm. And you end up pouring bad money, I mean good money behind bad money in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. You end up sticking around and, and, and trying to salvage something that you should just move on from. And, and you got to be very, I found, unemotional when it comes to business, when it comes to negotiating. Um, and, and that's the approach I've taken, and it's an approach that seems to work. And also, I don't know, it's, it, it's tough. Everybody's different. Certain people probably go a little bit longer than I may yeah. go you stick with things. So you yeah. stick a little bit more. Sort you want of, every, we all want everything to work. Yeah, of course, right? You wouldn't yeah. start it if you didn't want it to work. Yeah. But 
at least in business, things are a little more cut and dry where it's mm -hmm. like, okay, A plus B is not equaling C right now, and so let's move on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think companies, there's a grace period when you're starting one to go like, ah, let's give it some yeah, time, some right? Time. Especially if you believe in one, right? Yeah. There's some magic in the belief, and that might take a little bit of time. But I found that stuff that you really are passionate about, things you believe in, things you really are organic to you, tend to work or have some success in some, in yeah. some way, shape, or form. Yeah. I think when someone tries to do something that's completely out of character, completely yeah. doesn't fit them, especially if you're trying to sell yourself as part of the business, you get to really believe in it. I think mm -hmm. people now are so smart that they know if you are truly behind something, if you truly believe in something, and they know if you're just putting yeah. on the front. I think people are, I think the, I think the sub, I think the consciousness of culture is rising. Mm -hmm. I think we're aware of people's feelings and it's this, this metaphysical yeah. sort of environment of like energy and feeling authentic, authenticity from mm -hmm. people. I think we're getting more sensitive to I being agree. able to tune into that. Do you feel like I agree. That? I agree. And, and, and it's funny because, you know, being on TV now and I know it freaks everybody out. It freaks me out too. Yeah, how it the hell did you land on out. TV? Like, hell let's if I know. I told you when I saw you at the show, GMA, <laughs> third hour, I was like, you are the poster boy for, you're the poster child, not boy or girl or anything, not because I really care about the difference, but, but like you're the poster child for an athlete that's transitioned into a whole other field and done it so well, so... Bravo. Well, you know what? Remember that kid who cried during a football game? So I bug you about to see that kid now. You keep that up. It's How very hard happen? for me to see that. Yeah, but that's I, because okay. I'm just kind of It's okay. You're being seen. I'm just kind and of working. And like, be like, I'm being seen. It's okay. I'm okay, being I gotta seen. Learn it's okay. That part. That part I yeah. have to learn. I, that that I really have to get over that over that crutch. That that's would be okay. that would really change my life if I could could figure that out. There's we all have that got time. stuff. I got some time. You've got time, but but I see you, and I and I see that I see that transition being something that is so rare. Um, so really. Impressive, and it shows that your okay. values that applied to football are applying to just something else. And to be honest, that's what I hope for my life mm -hmm. is that I want to accomplish great things in a whole other arena because I, I would love the idea that whatever was true to me from core beliefs to work ethic to, to goals, however I worked my life, was I could just pick it up and place it somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't about that one thing and I was just good at that one thing. It's that I'm good at building something from myself. So I'm just curious how TV became the one. How did it happen and how did it happen? The biggest challenge for me, which I think is the biggest challenge for most people, not necessarily just athletes who come from a certain field, is doing something different. Yeah. Because you, especially athletes, you get so associated with one thing. Yeah. And you get associated with it, and then you just start to believe that it's the one thing that you do and you do well. It's your safe space. It's the only thing you're supposed to do. And the toughest thing for me was getting over the fact that I'm more than just an athlete. Mm -hmm. And you hear guys say that now, but it's true. It's not just a cliche. You have to get in your head that, yeah, okay, I was an athlete, and I had this great career, and but I'm allowed to have great career and other things. Mm -hmm. We People almost want to say, okay, you had a great career, great race car driver, stay there. Yeah. You've, had to, you've had the good fairy juice sprinkled on you in that career, that's enough. And I think for me growing up overseas and not being a football player, thinking that's what I'm gonna do with my life, it just kind of happened, made me feel like, okay, that was part of my life, is over now, let's get to something different. Wow, look at all these, life is full of great things out here that I never knew about. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I've always gone into everything very bright eyed, but I did have to get over, it took me a while to get over the fact that I was more than just a face that people would, would know from sports. And it's weird now because most people have no idea I played sports. Like kids come up to me and moms come up to me and they're like, and the, and the dads who used to be like, oh, go Giants, Michael, great job what you did. Now they come up and say, oh, I saw that cooking segment you did. I'm like, dude, you were the same dude talking about football. They're talking to me about cooking. But it's a compliment in the sense that it's complete transformation of, of a different, uh, into a, a, you know, going into a totally different career. 
But it all happened by happenstance, at least to start. I mean, I work hard at it, but I just like doing stuff when they would ask me, when I would do interviews. Because you would, lived in New York, so yeah, you were able to do shows and fill in, even yeah. while you were still working. When I was still could... playing, and they would say, oh, you got this thing, you want to come do it? Yeah. Um, oh, my God, do it. can I interview you? Yeah. And I even use the interview that's practice. Like, everybody gives cliche answers. I kind of push the envelope to try to give more interesting, funny yeah. answers to the routine questions. I would also talk to all the reporters and get to do it away from, you know, just the interviews. Like, the mess truth. with them and joke with them. The real facts. Yeah. And, and I also kind of learned at the end of my career, I didn't talk. I only talked like two days a week to the media. And I, I was just, I don't know how all these crazy thoughts come. I'm going, you know, if I talk every day, then I just become another player who talks every day. Nothing special with that. Kind of like going to, you show up at the, the same club every day, you're just another patron at the club. But if you pop in every once in a while, oh my God, it's a bigger deal. So I said, oh, I only talk Tuesday, I only talk Wednesdays or Thursdays and Sundays. That was it. It was kind of like a supply and demand yeah. when it comes to my yeah. quotes and interviews. I think that's how Aaron works it too. Yeah. <laughs> no. He's a low supply, high demand guy. And it makes them want it more. Totally. And what you say has more legs to oh, it. For sure. And it never hits the cutting room floor because you cut that, you're not getting something. You cut, it, you cut all you got this week. Yeah, so I always looked and said, wow, the, you, the media has been using us as, 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 as athletes and people in general for a long time. How about flipping it back? Mm -hmm. You control the conversation. Mm. You control the time. You control everything. And to me, it made everybody be a little bit more kind. Made everybody be a little bit more polite. Made everybody be a little bit more in tune and know that they better come correct. <laughs> because I may walk in and say, oh, today I'm answering three questions. I'm not upset, but kind of like a game, three questions today. <laughs> Somebody asked me four. I said, you can't count. I said three. All right, you guys, thank you. Other days I may go, I'm answering one question. Other day, I sit there and talk for 30 minutes. I always kept them off balance. And just doing those little things kind of gave me an idea. Wow, you know what? Hmm. Okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of good at this. This media thing's fun. Yeah, media thing's all right. And then I just kept getting invited to do stuff. And the Best Damn Sports Show. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you remember the Best Damn Sports I'd Show. I love it. That right there was like a great training ground for me because the first time I ever got a chance to like co-host something with a panel and and kind of be a part of like a, a show like that. And the best thing I did with them was my last year or two in the league, I signed a deal contract so that every Tuesday I would go sit in the studio by myself with just a camera in my face. And I couldn't see them, I could hear them. And to create a banter back and forth and to be interesting just with a camera in your face without any visual of who you're talking to, it taught me how to move my face, my eyes, the expression, and high, and highs and lows, and the voice inflection. It taught me how to almost entertain without seeing what the audience was, which it very much what I have to do on the daytime shows. Yeah. It's the same thing. When I was with Kelly and now doing, you know, I'm doing with Kiki and Sarah, it is the same thing. I, you know, facial expression when someone's talking, they say something. It's like, I don't know, I love it. I love figuring out all these little minute things that, that make Like you're your creating better. the motion at home. Creating the emotion that I'm feeling on my face so that you yeah. can feel it at home. Yeah. Because you could just sit there like this the whole time and be happy or sad and no one would know. It's great advice because I do that a lot. They're like, whenever I do things on TV, they would mm -hmm. be like, smile more. You got to smile more. I'm like, okay. And then I sit there, I'm like, God, this feels so weird. <laughs> and I have a natural like frown when I just sit there. Uh -huh. Like I actually, if I'm doing a, you know how when you do shots for something, they're yeah. like, oh, give, give me a serious face. Give me a happy face, right? My serious face was a smirk. Because otherwise I looked miserable as hell. Like I looked horrible. <laughs> And I realized that in a photo shoot in England I did, there was like a real serious one, and I looked and my, my mouth goes down. I'm like, oh wow, that's just terrible. So that's, that's an, yeah. in, that's, so visualize the emotion visualize that you emotion want to nice. create. Yeah, like. What other advice do you have for me? All that, all that craziness. Um, that and, and, and then the TV stuff, 
I'm very lucky. I have jobs where I could be myself. Huh. I don't have to be this way on TV and then I get over here and I got to be a completely, totally different doc- dude. Now, there's one thing delivering the news because right now, I'm, every job I have is so different. Oh, my God. The, the sports is great with the guys. I mean, the guys hanging out as if we hang out and talk about football anyway. It feel easy. It's easy. easy. It's kind of, you know, I have to know my stuff, but it's easy with the guys. And we're like dancing bears because we never know what each other's going to say. Mm. And it is all organic. The laughter is organic. The comments are organic because... The cold weather you're out there in is organic. The cold weather is <laughs> organic. But it's that, that show is all fresh because every day you have to pay attention because we don't know what each other is going to say. And it comes across on TV and we have a respect and a love for each other like brothers that it comes across. We hang out with each other when we're not on TV. We group text like we were really? every day. Every day, group really? text. And, but then when you go to like GMA, it's a totally different beat. It's like mm-hmm. serious news, yeah. but then you got to learn how to, you know, switch it up. Um, you know, now we're going to change, switch gears. And you go to something a little bit more funny or, or simple or light, and then you got to go back to something a little more heavy. Learning how to make the transitions in the news was is hard. And when somebody's telling a story and they throw it back to you, mm-hmm. and you got to figure out a way to button up that story and then transition it to the next story. I mean, all these things that look so easy yeah. when I watch the news, you don't even think about. When you're on it, you're like, and for two years at least, I was un, like sweating like a farm animal, <laughs> scared to death of screwing up. And now it's like second nature. It's like mm. repetition of things. That's, that was the hardest thing about the news. Um, doing daytime is, is great because it's a personality-based situation. And you have a good personality. Yeah, I mean, thank you, but I just, I'm allowed to be myself. And I mm. learned that as many jobs as I can get where I'm allowed to be myself, it's fantastic. Where do you feel like you're the most yourself? Because like, there's one thing to say, like, I'm myself on TV. And then that's a whole other thing when you go, this is where I am the most authentic me and I feel so good. Specific place? Where are you? What are you doing? In the Bahamas. Who's there? Is anyone in there? In the Bahamas on the golf course. <laughs> in the Bahamas on the golf course or literally at home. Like at home. Doing what? I'm quiet in a lot of ways. Like I'm, I'm simple. I, my, okay, best place for me is my man cave. By myself, for the most part. What's in or your man dog. cave? Cars. Cars? Cars, TV, a golf simulator, and a bar. What do you like to drink? Tequila. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tequila. Just straight up? You know, I, I would mix it up, but I'm kind of like a straight up on the rock with a lime guy. Okay. Cause when I, you know why? Because when I'm getting ready for Magic Mike... The uh, my trainer, she gave me this whole list. Casually, of stuff. he says, "When I'm what? getting ready for Magic Mike." Yeah, well, yeah, well trust me, I was little, yeah, I'm talking about scared to death. That was scary. But then after I stripped once, I was so different. <laughs> but <laughs> that's what but she said. My trainer was like, "No sugar, no dairy, no wheat, no alcohol." Mm-hmm. And I said, "Oh, I can do all the other stuff. I gotta have a drink every once in a while. Amen. That's just not gonna be Amen. realistic. It's just not gonna happen." I make wine, and it's the one thing I'm like, "Yeah, yeah. I really love it." So you gotta be realistic. So she said, "Okay, if you're gonna drink anything, tequila on the rocks with the lime. You don't have all the sugar and all these other Club things." Club soda, you could ask, add too if you yeah. really wanted yeah, to. Yeah, like, if you make really want to spruce it up. And so I kind of got into that vibe, and I love tequila. It's my drink. But I go to my man cave, and it probably would surprise people that I would literally sit watch TV, or I'll just get in the car and I'll just drive and come park it and get another one and drive. Just something with that solitude and the quiet time. And I love cars. Growing up in Germany and the autobahns and listening to the engines and just appreciating cars because I think that they're like art. Okay, well, what's the fastest you've gone on the autobahn then? I mean, that'd be dumb for me to not um, ask. Fastest I've ever been is 195 miles per hour. 195 yeah. on the autobahn. If I can go for right now, I'd go faster. Well, let's go. Yeah. I've never been on the You've Autobahn. You've never been on the Autobahn? But I have been over 195. But see, let me tell you what. I'm not driving with you. What? No. You expect me to ride with you at 195, no. but you're not riding with me at 195? Okay, because let me tell you why. 
See, who was I with? Michael Waltrip. Michael Waltrip. Michael Waltrip, I did this show way back in the day, which goes to show now that you we're talking about all this stuff and think about all these things that I've done because I look at where I am now and I kind of go, oh, this kind of, there were so many things, shows that I've done yeah. that I've forgotten about, people have forgotten about. And there was one, Make My Day was the name of the show, Make My Day. So we would find an athlete, find their biggest fan, surprise the fan with the athlete, and then take them to do something together. So Michael Waltrip was one of the guys we used. We went down, met the young lady, and we went to the track. He takes her on the track. I'm the host. I'm not supposed to be on the track. But he, of course, you want to get in the car? Oh, yeah, I'll go around with you. Right up against the wall, yeah. like that. And it's okay, and I'm like, okay, this is no, but then when you, somebody looking at you, go, <laughs> trying to see. Not looking gonna, at the road, yeah, talking like, to you. Look at me. <laughs> and I'm like, nah, I don't do it. Nah, y'all, you, you guys play too much. Well, it sounds like we're going to race each other on the Autobahn then. That, that we can do. Okay. You'll we smoke me, that. but you know, I'll, I'll meet you at the rest stop. <laughs> <laughs> Equipment matters. Equipment does matter. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll leave what it What is up. your happy place? Where is your calm oh. place? Where is your place to be totally you? Mm. Um, my, the most, re thing, the easiest repeatable scenario other than just being like, you know, something like on a beach somewhere where it's just beautiful, that, you yeah. know, and just having your, like feeling the environment and the saltwater air and um, just so much nature, so mm -hmm. integrated in nature, is to take my dogs for a walk. I, wow. I just love, I really discovered that about five years ago where that was my balance for my life was mm -hmm. just, I love to see the joy of them running around and yeah. having so much fun in nature and I love to be in it. So I prefer like trees that cover the top, right? So you're in nature, yeah. like really in the trees. So if I can find paths to walk on where I'm really in it, then it's just like, I mean, it, sometimes it's so beautiful or I get such an overwhelming feeling mm -hmm. um, of uh, just gratitude. Like I could cry just randomly, just like, wow, life is so fantastic yeah. and so beautiful. And I can just be in nature and have this emotion um, kind of puts things in perspective a little bit. So a little nature walk is probably my... My, my I love happy that. place. And I, I love my dog. Yeah, oh my God, dogs dog. are the best. I promise, you know, living here in the city, it's like, um, I feel bad. Like, I gotta walk my dog on the leash. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. then, you well, know, someday, and, someday. And, and I know, I will promise, you move out of the city? I promise him, yes, we're moving. I can't work like this forever. I'm like, we're moving, buddy. And I mountains or beach? Are you, you a mount mountains or beach guy? I can do both. I think, preferably, for the most part, warm weather and a beach. Okay. But I do think you need a place to go that's like removed from everything. Mm -hmm. I always loved that. I used to live in Pennsylvania when I played at one point. It's beautiful And I used there. to sit out there and watch the, the snow fall on the trees mm -hmm. and just do nothing. It yeah. was the absolute best to have quiet yeah. around you and just nature. And as you said, those just trees. Yeah. It's just very peaceful to me. Yeah. And, you know, I, I always think about myself like this. It, it's like a think of gratitude and I wonder just really quickly with you how you feel do you ever look and think about you when you were at an age where you had no idea what you were going to do with your life and you look at your life now and go wow oh yeah I mean it's easy to think and just like you were talking about about having an idea like being 10 years old and racing go-karts and thinking I'm going to go to college for engineering so I can work on my car and then the fact that I did that mm. and did what I did and became so well known and so different. Um, I look at that now, and I just you know it's one in a million, right? Yeah. And um, there's so much gratitude for it going like that. But I do come around to that very concept of I just believed it was possible. There's no reason why I made it happen, why it happened. Because when I came back from England after having having no job mm -hmm. and having no ride for two years, really. There's no reason why it should have worked out. I was 19 years old with no, no hope. But for some reason, I had such blind faith. That's what I always yeah. called it when I was a kid. Blind faith that it was going to work. I just knew I needed the opportunity. Whatever. If I was given the opportunity, I knew that it could be really big. I just knew it could be really big. And I didn't know what that looked like, but I just knew it. And I knew I had too much to offer. Yeah. So that belief is super powerful. So... Um, 
Look, you have so many things going on. You have your show. You have a clothing line yeah. that's coming out in JC Penney's. What's it called? Yeah, we have a clothing line. We've been. It's called um, co uh, Collection by Michael Strahan. Is our yeah. formal wear like suits, yeah. ties, cuff, yeah. cufflinks, belts. Um, you name it. We have MSX, which is our athleisure line, mm -hmm. and we've had collection for four years or so. It's the number one selling. Um, Formal wear, men's wear. Well done. Um, yeah, super. I dabbled in the clothing JCP. world, and that's tough. It's a tough world. Yeah. You also it's have a, a show world. with A-Rod coming out? We got out? a show with A-Rod called Back in the Game on CNBC. What's the and premise of that show? The premise of that show. We, Other we than getting one. back in the game. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but it, it's interesting because we not only did athletes, we did, you know, some other celebrities who have had fame, had fortune, a lot of, a lot of times have lost it all or mm -hmm. a chunk of it who just need a, like someone to give them faith in themselves to get back in the game and to show them how to manage their life and what mm. their life is now. Because as we know, when you retire, a lot of people retire, they didn't save, they didn't plan for the future, they didn't have the business acumen to, to create something. A-Rod's so good at that. I yeah. mean, he's been investing since he was in his 20s. In his I, 20s. And, and it's really I, impressive. At first, when he, we did the first, we did one last year and I was like, oh, let's see. And I watched it and I hit up Alex and I said, dude, I'll be honest with you, when you came in to do it, I wasn't sure how you were going to do, absolutely crushed it. Mm. He is so good. And um, so we're back in the game. We have a Vander yeah. Holyfield is one of our got Ryan Lochte. Like, mm. we went out and, and cool. got some great people who really want to change their life. And it's not a vanity show to say, okay, here, you know, just put these names out there. Sincerely helping people get back on their feet and trying to change their lives. And you'll see some tough conversations when you have to go and you know, Alex has to sit there and tell this person who's used to being the star and their wife or their fiance, you know what? Can't afford this house. Can't afford that car. I know what you're used to, but mm -hmm. that's not your life now. Mm -hmm. and how to get them to accept and move mm -hmm. on and, mm -hmm. and, and change cool. for the better, but yet have ideas of what they want to do in the future and mm -hmm. have him help guide them in those ways. And then with you with the mindset, I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, your mindset is so powerful. Um, that's going to be amazing. But like yours. I'd like to see it. Well, you know what? Um, but, but I love that. You know, we you both talk... accomplished great stuff, and, you know, I think that, you know, Yes, I got lucky along the way too. You got to be at the right place at the right time, but you also have to uh, believe it's possible, and you have to stick it out. And when it gets harder, you have to get ready to dig dig deeper. Yeah. Um, no, Bob. Right. Oh, we, you yeah, gotta, you know you gotta what? dig deeper. So what? What I know, and I could. I feel like we could just go on and on, but um, maybe you could just um, give us maybe what has been your greatest life lesson so far. My greatest life lesson so far is probably, and I, and I always try to remind myself that what I do is not who I am. What I do is not who I am, which keeps you humble because you don't think, you know, everybody's gonna treat me a certain way and I absolutely get it. I'm gonna be treated as a celebrity and a star. I get it, but that is not who I am because they treat me that way because of what I do. And I, that's why I do things for myself. I don't require a lot of extras and people and attention and all these things. I try to make my life as simple as it could be. I try to stay in a, in a, in a group of people who, are, who keep me grounded, who are normal yeah. in a lot of ways, not, not who don't look at themselves in an elevated way. And I think that that's the biggest lesson. It's like what I, what I do is not who I am. So I need to keep those two people separate, even though a lot of what I do is my personality, the things that other people see and they bring towards you because of what you do on TV or whatever, it's not reality what life really is. Well, what you do is not forever. It is not so forever. So if you wrap yourself up in what you do mm -hmm. and then that ends, who are you? And, great and I think for me, even in football, I could have played longer. And even in this TV stuff, I already know in my head I'm going to get out before they get me out, before, before they think I should leave. Nothing scares me more than overstaying a welcome. That's where I should end then because I'm pretty sure you need to go. <laughs> <laughs> you can, I can Getting do this the all high day. Side. <laughs> All I gotta do is, now I gotta, I gotta run to the gym and then I gotta go to a movie screening. This is better than the gym, so I can have an excuse not to go today. Okay, part two started up again. Ah. I don't know. Thank you so much, Michael. Of this course. was really fun.
Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. And also thank you so much Trevor Hall for the awesome music. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.